My name is Will Bellamy, and I attended the Pace University Musical Theater Program from 2012 till 2016. I've been performing since I can remember. I've been singing since I can remember. Come from a family of performers. My aunts are singers. My grandmother was a singer. And I think singing and, and performing is, um, it's like breathing to me. I feel like it's something that like wakes me up every day. It's something that inspires me. Um, probably is the most important thing I've ever um, been able to do to express myself in my life. My first like theater experience, I was doing a, I hate this, but a Cowboys and Indians like play at like a theater festival and I didn't have the lead. I was in the ensemble, but I learned the leads part by watching them off stage and they got sick before a performance and I offered myself to play their part. And they were like, well, you don't know it. And I was like, I do know it. And I did it for like the director and the whole team. And they call my mom, they're like, oh my God, like you're selling this part. Like he should do it. Like he's ready, he's full out. And honestly, until like since that moment, it's really just been like a ride. I just feel like ever since then, I never want to stop. And I went to theater camps, I went to French Woods and I continued my, just like my, love for theater. I, I started going for three weeks of summer and then I started going for six weeks of summer. And it felt like I just had a home in the theater um, to be my authentic self. You know, I think other than theater, the other worlds I lived in, I had to kind of, um, I had like my straight drag. I had like my like white boy drag. And then I felt like theater, I was just like, Will, I was just me. Um, and I got to like use my voice to help um, paint that picture really clearly um, for other people. I feel like I always knew that I wanted to go into theater professionally. I, I, I remember being like, I know for a fact I want to like provide for myself through this art form professionally. Like that was like a fact. Like this is how I was going to like put food on the table. This is how I was going to like provide for myself and, and grow and this was gonna be like my avenue, this was it. Like that was the choice. My first round of college auditions, I was maybe like 70 pounds plus what I am now, maybe more, like 80 pounds plus this. And it was such a different experience to audition for schools and have um, like a strong skill set, but physically I was fat. And I noticed that like my feedback was always about how great my talent was, but how um, they couldn't find a space for me physically within the program. That was like something I noticed a lot with, especially the top tier schools, Carnegie, Michigan, like that was kind of like a, a overall feedback I got from, from those schools. I was drawn to Pace because the, the program was in the city, but it also had this, um, this different element of, of growing in the city, which I thought for me at the time was such an advantage. You know, I thought that you got to really cook in New York and kind of like shed these like layers of, um, of where you come from and kind of get to be creative with your, yourself and not just about like being the perfect musical theater student, but also like, what is, you know, living in the East Village do for you? What is living in FIDA? What is living in Brooklyn? How does that, you know, shape you? What kind of experiences do you have? The kind of people that you meet? It just all was way more attractive to me than leaving a program that was cookie cutter and going to another program that was just as cookie cutter and, you know, so formulaic about, you know, how to be the perfect Black actor. And I looked at the alumni and I was like, oh, like these, these people are, you know, aren't, blockbuster but they are they're like rooted like they're like they're giving me joe's pub they're giving me downtown they're giving me like you know these these references that i had known you know visiting new york and i'd seen in my like nerdiness um that i hadn't seen other programs kind of be able to gather their 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 student body to to like endeavor on that so i was really attracted to that aspect of pace and then um i got to my audition 
And it went well. I got in on the spot and Amy and Bob like begged me to come to Pace and they asked me where else I was like auditioning, where else I'd gotten in. And they were like, fuck Penn State, fuck Carnegie, like come here. Like we'll do whatever we need to do to get you in here um, by the university standards. But like theater wise, you were completely in. Like we want you to come here. And I was like, great, like lit. Like any more auditions I had, not going. Anywhere else, not going. I kind of was like, sold on pace and I think I was sold a lot because I was accepted into the program doing material that I felt was like true to who I was and wasn't cookie cutter and was out of the box and I was like okay like they're like feeling like what I'm really putting out there um and I think like as like a black artist that kind of validation and that kind of appreciation goes such a long way because oftentimes you don't get to feel accepted by doing material that isn't in the box. You know, when someone's like feeling your choices that are, that are different or that are experimental, for lack of a better word, it feels so good. You feel like, you feel really fucking seen. And I think that went a long way for me in choosing schools. First, like my class at Pace was like crazy. Because I was like, all these black people, this is amazing. And then like seeing their receipts, I was like, wait, all these black people are so talented. And it kind of was like a, like, you get what you wish for a moment. I was like, oh my God, like, this is such a dream. Like, I'm working with all these like crazy talented black people. We're going to be in class together. We're going to be learning material together, working together, being creative together. And it really felt like a gift. I was just like, oh shit, like this is exactly what I've been dreaming about. Amy was just super, um, she was like our biggest cheerleader, it felt like. She was like, this class is gonna change the game. We're so different. We're going to really do great things. And it was like, I felt like I was the fucking Beatles, you know? We felt like we were like on top of the world. This was like so new and, you know, felt like, musical theater pioneering in a, in a sense of like really taking these these groups of, of of students of color and letting them grow and be artists in the city in this program and I was like this is going to change the game this is different this is this is it our gathering was something really special Ugh, like we had so many group chats before we got to school and we like shared videos of each other singing and we shared introductory videos of each other, just telling everyone more about who we are, where we come from, our background. And it, it was such a blissful time. Like we were so just happy and excited and we couldn't wait to get into like a classroom and like sing for each other and share and like support each other. It was just like day one, we were at school, we were in the practice room, like literally then first night, we were all in the practice rooms performing for each other, fangirling for each other. And that was just such a great feeling to have all that like love and support for each other. Um, especially knowing what happens in the end. Like that, that, that start off was, was just great. I mean, like, just so happy. <laughs> First year Pace was super thrilling. Amy casted me in, in her show. And I think I went straight to callbacks. I didn't even have to audition. I think she like let me come to callbacks and like fight for my part in the show there, um, which ended up being like a total black part in, in the show. And I sang about, I, I was a Martin Luther King type character without the name. Um, and I sang about how you can't judge a book by its cover. Um, looking back, I'm just like, choice choice casting but again you know her and I had a, a great relationship after that I worked with her I felt like I can go to her with any problems or any any issues I had we talked probably like if not every day every other day whether it was like emails or I would show up to her office get coffee kind of just like I think she really it felt like she really cared about my well-being within the program and I felt like she wanted to be really hands-on with me on my growth as an artist in the program and really hands-on with how I view things. And we talked about 
uh, my personality, my energy, how to kind of conduct myself in the classroom. I remember her telling me that my energy was loud. And if it wasn't like positive energy, it was something I had to like really like keep in check. Um, if there were teachers that I had kind of like, you know, issues with energetically, she'd be like, keep your energy pleasant and like to myself and more calm, more reserved, um, stuff like that. She really, you know, it felt, you know, it felt like grooming, of course, but I think at the time I was so excited and I was so, um, I, I felt grateful to have that kind of attention that I really, really yearned for as a young artist that I felt like, you know, I was getting it and I was, I was thrilled. I think that, you know, and this is like one of those like advantages of being like slightly older than the people that I was around. I think like, I think be, I was like maybe a year and a half older than everyone in the class or two years older than everyone in the class. And I felt like, I felt like um, she saw that I maybe was like, just like really eager in a way that I think she saw I was ready to like be so groomed that our relationship really was down to her being like, oh, wait, great. So what are you singing for this? What, cho what choices are you doing? What are you giving me? What are you trying to sell? What are you trying to get across in these auditions? And every time I, I was ready to be like, I'm giving this, I'm giving that, I'm giving out of the box, I'm giving like Black Boy Next Door. Like these are the, these are the themes that I was coming at her with. And I think, I think it excited her for the purposes of it was in a realm she could control and it was kind of like these, um, these narratives of my talent and my story that she could control. And she could come and say to me, mm, don't like that song. Don't like that writer, that choice. Get from me something different. Email me more choices tonight and see, I'll see if I like those. You know, that was the kind of prep work and the kind of attention that I was getting from her from day one, honestly. And I, I, I kept up with it. I, I was diligently like in her office, emailing her. I wanted... Um, I wanted that so bad. I wanted that work. I wanted that, that, that level of attention. I was so, so, so eager for it. And I was so grateful. Oh my God. I like keep saying this, but I just like, I, that for me, that was like what school is about, what being a student was about. So I just, I was so thrilled to have had that. And I think that whenever I stepped a little out of line, she always knew how to like reel me back in with how to like behave or how to like what material or kind of just how to like spin things. Cause she, I think she was like, well, I know it works for, for black men. And there were, there was one upperclassman, John Michael. Hi, John Michael. Um, all love. Um, and I felt like she kind of used him as like a, like a, one of the examples on how to be or how to behave because John Michael also is someone who's very personable, very, everyone loves John Michael. He's a very, very pleasant person. And I think she wanted to, she saw that like there was a, an energy of that in me and wanted to really groom that to keep that, 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 that image and that like, you know, that setup going within the program. And if our end of freshman year, it was announced we're doing Dogfight. Dogfight is a Pasek and Paul musical to, you know, white musical theater men who went to Michigan. Um, you know, they had a lot of success. I saw the show off Broadway at Second Stage. You know, I, I was so into the music. It was contemporary. It was, it was a vibe. But, you know, as we know, the show was all white. All the white boys that, you know, as a student of color, all the white boys who get all those parts, you just imagine, like, they're probably going to get them because this is the society we live in. But I, I thought, you know, at Pace, Amy, and I'm quoting her, doesn't believe in color by line casting. She believes in colorful casting. 
So like I had that idea in my mind and I'm like, okay, well, yeah, she's gonna she's gonna throw some throw some black people up there. Like we're we're ready. We can do just as well as the white boys. We're we're giving you body, we're giving you face, we're giving you voice, we're giving you work. And I realized as I got into the callbacks, it was like, okay, all the leads are gonna be white. The smallest part possible, like the smallest part possible will go to a person of color. And I was like, wow, okay. And then I get to callbacks and I realize there's only three of us there. Um, one of them being John Michael and the other one being a good friend of mine, Saidu. And it was like, I'll never forget just the kind of pressure it felt being like one of three black men called back for this role with like all of these white boys who, you know, they walked into the callback with so much ease because they were like, great, all I have to do is show up and be white and be cute and, and sing well enough. And that was it. And I felt like for the black boys, we had to come in and literally be like perfection. Like we, it felt like we couldn't like sing a, a wrong note or like flub any of the sides or not come in like looking hot and ready. It felt like there was so much pressure for us because I mean, I think we knew that there was really only room for one. And I remember I left the callbacks and I was friends with the stage manager and he told me, he was white, he told me that it was a constant battle between me or John Michael. It was like, Will or John Michael. If Amy got her cast, it was Will. If Joel Wagner got his cast, it was John Michael. And like hearing that information, I think like end of freshman year, like in a dorm room, like drinking, you know, it, it set such a tone that, you know, I thought there was so much room for us. You know, I, I felt like she invited us into this, this community and um, I felt like there was room for all of us. And it just, I think that night I really realized like, you know, she didn't have any interest in making room for all of us and there could only be one. And um, I think looking back, I wish I had this mindset to address the situation appropriately. But I think at the time, being younger and, and being more naive, I, I, I wish I didn't let that instill a competitive nature between me and other Black peers that was incited by white people. Seeing how that plays out in our industry now, it's, it was, it's alarming to know that like that was that seed was planted like, like as a freshman year, like as kids, like that idea that there is only room for one of us and that that setup of competition within this white world was started like then, especially for me. And that energy just like didn't, didn't end. Whether we were aware of it or not, it was always like, okay, it's you or John Michael or, it, or it's you or Saidi or it's you or Al. It was like never like, we all had room to stand on our, our own two feet in these productions, in these spaces. It was like, okay, well, you'll, either be you or you were the other one. And end of freshman year, they released the cast list for Dogfight. I found out I got in. Yes, we're happy. Things were great, yada, yada. There is this thing called the pyramid. And, um, you know, I know you guys are watching, so I don't want you to feel like this is me attacking you, but I want to be clear on how that setup really affected the, the environment. Um, if anyone's watched Dance Moms, there's a pyramid that Abby Lee Miller has all the girls watch every, every, every week. It's a pyramid of like who's the most talented and in like pyramid order, like most talented at the top, like talented, but like not as good as the rest at the bottom. And um, everyone in the program looked to this pyramid. It came out every few weeks and it really honestly featured all the white people who were the best in the program. Usually all the white girls, usually all the white boys who were pretty with like a pretty voice. And I remember after I got cast on Dogfight, I made the pyramid. And I remember I was like, maybe at the bottom of the pyramid or like mid bottom of the pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid was Amy Rogers. And I, it was just like interesting to think that like, I made it into the club. Like I'm the one, I'm the token who made it into the pyramid club. Like there weren't other black people on the pyramid. I was just me. And I can tell you for a fact, the black kids in my class were, and 
respect respectfully, light years ahead of a lot of the white upperclassmen that have been featured on the pyramid, cast more, gotten more opportunities. So to me, it was like, it was so uncomfortable because I felt like in this white culture of pace, it was like a compliment. But me knowing what I knew, I was like, this is like, this is insulting. And the fact that Amy like liked it and supported it and thought it was so funny, it was like a joke. It made me realize like what I was really, what I was really getting myself into. And going off into like the summer, going into sophomore year, it really, it really highlighted the kind of environment that we were in. And I, and I definitely was, was skeptical. I was actually, I was fucking scared. I was scared. I was scared that I wasn't going to be able to, I was like, fuck, I'm like, I'm the, I'm, I'm the house Negro. Like, what am I going to have to do to keep up with the parents or keep up with whatever expectation they're holding me um, to because I'm the only black boy allowed in the club? Sophomore year, we started dogfight. Um, we had started pre-productions like right before school started. So a lot of us were in the city and I felt so much pressure to be obviously the, like the best version of myself. And I remember I was like, I'm not going to drink one like sip of alcohol, all dogfight. I'm not going to smoke one puff of weed, all dogfight. I'm going to be sober. I'm going to be like on my grind. I worked out twice a day, every day. And I wanted to make sure I just was ready to, to pull up for myself. I just think, you know, being the only black person in the cast, I was like, I have to be great. I can't miss one. No, I can't have a day of being vocally tired. And those like unrealistic expectations that we have as black people, um, it's unfortunate because all those fears I had about it, like literally came true in rehearsal. You know, I, I was always on time. I was never late. I was always prepared. I was always vocally ready. Um, and I did not see those standards being held for my white counterparts. I mean, I was like, okay, cool. You know, I, I didn't feel threatened by any of them. I knew my worth. I knew my skill set. I was like, I can sing just as pretty as them, just as high, if not higher than them. So I was prepared to come to, to come to, to play. And I noticed like they weren't, you know, they did have days where they were vocally not prepared to sing the material they were assigned. Corey couldn't really sing the song he was assigned. And you know, it's interesting to notice that there were things that he that they let slide for him. You know, they changed keys for him in the song in the song Candace sang. If I couldn't sing my part one day or I was vocally tired after singing like G's and B's all morning, they'd be like, oh, do you want to sing the lower part? Oh, we're going to assign you the lower part. And I was like, oh, got it. Like I get punished for like showing up and being a little tired where they get they get worked with. They get they they get to get adjustments to figure out how to, to best serve how to best serve the material for them. And I was like, that's interesting. Even even I'll never forget. Like we were moving, you know, we were rehearsing and we're moving into like the next the next phase. And they were like, all right, tomorrow, boys, bring your character shoes. We don't want street shoes in rehearsal. We do not like it was like in big bold letters in the email. We do not want street shoes in the rehearsal. The next day, I'm the only person who brought character shoes. The only person. No one says a word. Corey and Charles show up late to rehearsal. No one says a word. And they're just like laughing about it. It's like a joke. And I'm like, okay, like, you know, here I am like outworking these boys, out presenting these boys, but it just felt like it didn't matter. And Amy didn't say one word ever about them goofing off, them being late, Corey not being able to sing the songs, never. There was never, and I remember our stage manager, he said, I just want to know that Will's the only person here who actually listened to what I asked and brought character shoes to rehearsal. To like, he said this to silence. No one, no one said anything, no one apologized, no one said, oh my bad, I'm sorry, you know, I'll, I'll step up next time, I, apo I apologize, never. But when I, you know, we, we felt like Amy felt the need to like harbor and, and, and like really challenge me on all of my little scenes, all my little, all my little dialogue I had, like if it wasn't to her level of perfection, it felt like I was a problem. And I think because of the environment and because of the way it was set up, it was like, 
you know, if you if you aren't on five, like it, you're getting a bunch of notes. But the white kids, if they were off their mark or they were like not bringing it, it was like, it's okay. Not even it's okay. We won't even talk about it because it's not a problem for us. I think because I stood out being the only black person there, I had to like always be perfect. And I think that that kind of pressure and where I was at mentally was just, was a lot. And I think once the process ended, I realized how, how heavy that was. And I think for me, a breaking point during the dogfight process was when we got to meet Pasek and Paul and they, they came to our rehearsal and they were, you know, lovely and, and, and so nice. And they were giving us all these compliments. And I asked about, um, you know, why there wasn't people of color in the original show. And their response was that um, it, would, it would have complicated the story. If they added any, any, any people of color, it would, have, it would have complicated the message. They would have had to expand on the book. It would have been such a problem. Just imagine how that feels to be like the one black person in the room having to like fight through the fact that like you are held to a different standard than all the white people in the room. And then finding out that the people who wrote the show just didn't even want you in the show. Like at all. They didn't want you there. You weren't. Like, this material was not meant for you to have a place in it, to shine, to, to give your gifts to the material. It just, it wasn't meant for that. It wasn't meant for me. And I think, like, knowing that, though knowing that information made me work a lot harder, but I think the, the negative effects of that um, and, like, the harm that that did was so much greater than how hard I could have worked. I mean, I was... I was, you know, I, I sacrificed a lot to be in that show and to, and to do well. And it felt like it didn't matter because I was just like a token. Most dog fights, um, we found out that we were doing a, a Stephen Schwartz project. It was some music by Stephen Schwartz, some that was unreleased, some that we were like premiering. And, you know, I think I remember I was like, okay, great. Like, I know this is going to be a vocalist type of project. You know, our class has like a lot of vocalists, you know, especially black vocalists. I was like, great, we're going to be up in here. You know, this is going to be an opportunity for us. And Amy has said to us, she was like, this show is about vocal acrobats. If you can't, if you can't sing up to the rafters and play around up there, I, this is not the show for you. And we were like, great. You're definitely, you know, letting us know what the expectation is. I think everyone who knew they could do that Knew they, could, knew they could do that and was ready to come into the room. The cast list came out and it was, again, your favorite white boy, Corey Giacoma. And another peer of ours, um, Aaron Albert, was the other lead, the other, other white male figure that dominated the program. Um, and we were thrown. We were definitely thrown because, again, um, we're talking about strengths, vocal strengths, that kind of you know, lied in a lot of the black students, especially, you know, when it comes to doing more contemporary pop music, which is what Stephen Schwartz kind of tells in. And it was, we were really confused that they would give these parts to, um, to two white guys who couldn't really perform the material to the best of its ability. I think it just set a tone. It was like, okay, you can meet every requirement. You can be able to, you know, hop through any, any test or drill they have for you. And if you're white, you just bypass all that. If you're a white male and, and you're likable and you're attractive by their standards, you just, just go right in and 
that was very obvious to us. Even to the, to the point where like, they had to again, lower keys, change keys, adjust the music for these white boys to even sing it. And again, it was just like, like a slap in the face, a punch in the gut that we're working four times as hard as them at this point. It's sophomore year, we've upped the ante. We're like out here. Like you, you asked us what we were doing. We were preparing for class, working out, finding material, researching. I was at Lincoln Center every Saturday morning watching a new musical, watching a play, taking notes. I mean, the, the preparation that we took on our education and to come into to the workspace was it, was, it was high level. And I couldn't say the same for our white counterparts. You know, I, I just, to be honest, I couldn't. They just didn't take it that seriously. They were always ha ha, he he, laughing and joking. And, you know, they, they really succeeded in these education opportunities. So I think the craziest part, especially about this, this situation, was that <laughs> we found out, like, yet again, yet again, that the white students were allowed to not be up to par. This is the second time that I had seen amongst a list of other classroom experiences where I saw like a, like a production that was mounted and the white students were not held to the same standard as the black students because they got to not be as great, period. And in that same conversation where Amy just told us how the, 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 the bar for Stephen Schwartz was so high, she told us that the reason that we weren't cast um, the black kids specifically weren't cast is because we were being being reserved to do Once on This Island. And that was the black show. And that was the black show written by white people. The black show that we were, you know, that, that was our show. We were being held off because that was our show. That was, that was her, that was her explanation. And it was just, again, like, Another fucking slap in the face, you know, like you're telling me that our efforts and all of our hard work just honestly doesn't matter because we're going to be held for this black show. And not only just the black show, she made it very clear that everyone auditioned for the show. We were like, okay, cool. Like you're doing a black show. It'll just be the black kids auditioning or the kids of color auditioning. And they made it clear to us that the auditions were open to everyone. White kids, black kids, students of color, everyone. And it just didn't sit, sit well with us. It just wasn't right. And that after the whole process, auditions, callbacks, the, the work that it takes to prepare for the callbacks, all of that, after all of that process, you still were giving the, the white students opportunities that they couldn't execute. I mean, lowering keys, lowering keys, like to us, like the professional standard of like, and listen, that is no shade. We all know in show workshops, they change keys, whatever. But if you're holding the standard to us to be that, then stick to your word. Why is there a gray area when it comes to the white kids? Why is there room for them to play around with keys and lower keys so they can't hit the notes, but not for us? Oh, once on this island, <sighs> what an experience. Um, from the jump, I was like, wait, we're doing a black show with an all white creative team. White director, Bob Klein, white choreographer, um, and a white music director, Joel Wagner. From the beginning, it was uncomfortable to know that like, you know, all these black kids are being put in the care of these problematic white people. And right from the auditions, you know, we, I, you know, you could see the fact that we all were kind of put into this space together affected us in, in, in a negative way. You know, I, like the colorism conversation already started, you know, I, I felt like I wasn't like, light skin enough or hot enough to play the male lead. I had to, I had to ask to get seen for that part. I had to ask to get a callback for that part. Um, 
And I felt like, again, it was a, a situation where, like, the black men are, like, getting put right up against each other. And it wasn't, it didn't feel positive. It felt like, it felt negative. And it felt like they were kind of exploiting us to, like, see how we would fare against each other. And then also, the white kids, like, the white kids were allowed to audition for the show. And the things we saw them show up in, crimped hair, leaves in their, in their motherfucking hair, like, okay, like, wait, what? <laughs> like, it just completely threw, threw us off. And that was like, and we had to be in that environment and still be professional and show up and deliver. While in the waiting room, there's literally a bunch of white kids trying to play T Moon, the lead of the show, who's black. So, it, like, the conversations that needed to be had from administration for, like, in care for us, they weren't had. Clearly, they didn't care about our, our well being, how much harm even just that audition experience would do to us. And Bob Klein, again, with his problematic perspective, he did a bunch of things that, that really did a lot of harm to me in that process. You know, he would, he was, he was um, key into putting the black guys up against each other. You know, he called me back for the male lead, knew he wasn't gonna cast me, had no interest in casting me, but he made me sit in the waiting room as if he was going to call me back to see more of me. He literally said, wait, I, wanna, I want you to come back in the room. I'm gonna see you and just did it. And in a feature conversation, he told me that he had no interest in casting me and that he just wanted to, to keep me there to see how it would affect my mental, how I would react to it. If it would make me angry, if it would make me, make me upset, how, how I would react. He thought that was um, healthy to do and, the, and a positive thing to do. And the conversations that we had in the rehearsal room, I mean, these white men just saying whatever they want to us. Um, Joel Wagner, our music director, literally used the analogy that we, he was like, imagine you got a skillet and you put some grease on that skillet and it's popping and it's, and it's moving and it's shaking. And then we want the vocal explosion to be like, just adding fried chicken to that. And you just frying some chicken and it's sizzling and popping. And I, I remember us, I mean, I didn't look to my left or my right, but I remember we all felt that collective like, really? Okay. Okay. This is what we're doing here. And I think as an underclassman, you know, aside from like, my ability to, to speak for myself or my peers, you didn't know when the right moment was to speak up about these certain, certain instances. And, you know, Pace is such a professional environment. We didn't know how to react. I tell you, when we got home, we knew how to react. But in the moment, I just couldn't believe that Joel would make such a, a disgusting analogy to a bunch of Black kids. It, it just... It's just fucking stupid. That's what it is. Stupid. Ignorant. I say this a lot, but I feel like, again, <laughs> another slap in the face because we were just getting like our, like our fucking asses beaten over the course of the years. Um, was that the funds that were allocated for our show were non-existent. There was no... There was literally no interest in making sure that we had any black creative team members. Um, I think they hired a, hired, I'm sorry, that informs that he was being paid. They had a, uh, another black student come work on Haitian dialect with us. And by work, I mean, come to two rehearsals. I'm sure he was unpaid. And it, it was just like, damn, you were holding us out to do this, this big black show but you literally gave us not an ounce of resources to actually make sure that we were doing the show at the best of our abilities. You had a white woman teaching us African dance. You had a white gay man telling me how to be an, an older black male. And then you had a white gay music director telling me how to sing black. I mean, 
<laughs> cool. Clear. Clear as day what your intentions are. Clear as fucking day. Those problems just piled on. I mean, Bob telling me that I need to realize that I'm not as hot as I think I am, even though I've, I've made such a journey and that I should be playing the dad because that's what I should be doing because I'm not hot enough to play the leading man. And it's just like that kind of environment, like fighting through that was really, really tough. It was, it was fucking miserable. It was so miserable. And then it just, it's crazy because the thing that, that combated that was that I was around my people. I was around my best friends. I was around people that I, I loved so much. And it's like, I'm grateful that we got to grow together and survive together. But the fact that we had to survive that is, is so fucked up. It's really fucked up. And we went through that pain together. And it was every day. Every day. And, we, and it's funny because the black kids, <laughs> we still showed up to class. We still sang our songs. We still did our, our fucking homework. But you notice that whenever the white kids were in rehearsal or in, in tech, they would get excused from class. They would come to class and not know their songs and not be held accountable for that. But we literally, we were. If we did not come to, we literally went to our 9 a.m. tech class the day after our show closed and sang our songs perfectly, where I remember a white girl in our class came to class and sang the song off her phone. She looked at the sheet music on her fucking iPhone and was still given a better grade than us because according to Amy, we were blessed to hear her sing. End of sophomore year ended with like, I think I would say like, just really gray. You know, I, we had finished Once on This Island and um, I think we, as, as you know, black peers, we felt proud of what we survived through and what we did with it. And, but we still had a lot of problems with how it happened. And I think that there were whispers of those problems. And instead of Amy, you know, trying to come and take care of the black students that went through all this harm from our white creative team, it seemed like she kind of reinforced all of the, the whispers of us being ungrateful for having this show. Um, she reinforced that by little things. You know, she, after every big show, Amy sends like a congratulations email about how great they were. We received none. Um, usually she greets the cast after she comes to see their show. We received no greeting. Um, so the end of, of that time, and, and her and I were still, you know, we still had a, a relationship where we talked pretty frequently, but it was just, it was really obvious that the, the, the racial unjust, like the, the energy was, was carving a, a wedge between our communication because I don't think she wanted to address a lot of the racial problems that were happening. And I was... You know, I was trying to, I think, tiptoe around it, but I felt like it was extremely obvious, the issues that were happening, and that I know she heard about them. I was so excited to go into junior year because we were doing Light in the Piazza, and we were doing Godspell, but more specifically, Light in the Piazza was kind of like, like any like musical theater nerds, like dream score, dream show, Adam Gettle is like, you know, a... a a musical theater god, and I knew that it was like going to be all white, assuming, and I still went into the audition, you know, preparing my best, Adam Gettle, and I didn't get a call back. But I remember Miss Victoria Clark, um, who was our, our, our director, the Tony Award winning director. She, I sang for Fabrizio, who's the male lead, and I, I sang it really well, and she was moved and wanted to hear me work on it. And then at the end of it, made this comment about she's open to casting a black Fabrizio or open to casting the show, this part with a black actor and only called back one black actor who was like of lighter skin for the part. 
Um, and I think that really just, it like, again, made the message extremely clear that they had no intentions of casting black people in the show, for real, for real. And that we, again, were just putting, preparing ourselves, putting ourselves through all of this preparation to not get cast yet again, going into my junior year after, you know, after jumping through all these fucking hoops, it was like, again, we're not good enough. We don't, we're not ready enough. And it, it was just really depressing, honestly. You know, it was just such a, such a blow to us that, you know, again, you know, kind of this material that um, had a high, like the bar was really set high vocally. And, you know, again, it went to all the white kids. <laughs> and then I, I noticed that the production value for The Light in the Piazza was crazy. Like they hired the actress who won the Tony for the leading part of the production as a director. They hired the person who did the transcription for the original Broadway production to work as a dialect coach on our production. We even also got a uh, outside theater to do the show. The set was stunning. I mean, if you just look at the, that small list, it was so obvious that like the white show, like the limit didn't exist. There was no, there was no like, cap to the kind of resources that, that they had available to them. Like that education of doing that show is, it's what you pay for. Like that was like what you pay for. And it was interesting that the white students got what they paid for and the black students got nowhere near that. Nowhere near. It's down to the fact that Amy chose the show for a white student. She literally chose the show for a white girl in the class above us. She literally said, this show is for you. And it's just, it's again, to reflect on the fact that like, you know, the white kids get that privilege of being like, we're choosing shows for you. We're choosing material for you. It's all for you. So like, what do we get? And do we just get crumbs? And are we supposed to be grateful for those, crumb those crumbs? Because that's what it seems like you're saying. Amy had um, heard whispers of any sort of like racial unjust that was happening. And her remedy for that was to hold a um, race symposium for the whole theater department and to have guest speakers who were working or on Broadway or whatever. And it was weird because we felt like it was super forced. Um, it felt like she was kind of pushing whatever issues there were off of her and making it kind of like an industry problem. And she kind of was just like hands up with the situation. Um, so we felt hesitant about the race symposium. It really was like the catalyst for a lot um, to come after that. Um, the highlight for me of the race symposium was Amy getting up in front of the whole program and saying, you know what I think? I don't believe in colorblind casting. I believe in colorful casting. You know that I I have a, a I don't I don't believe in colorblind casting. I don't like those words. I like colorful. I like inclusion. <laughs> And everyone's like, yes, yes, bitch, yes. And <laughs> it's a joke because to know that she had the audacity to get up in front of all of us and say that shit and one, not mean it. And one, actually give us the, the weird, like to give us the idea that she wanted to open up the door to these kind of tough conversations when she actually didn't. She actually had no intentions of having these conversations for herself. She wanted us to do it for ourselves. And that's where, that's where a lot of the problems, I think, really began. And when things got really, really rocky. And then why are you throwing back in my face? I'm paying for it. Like, fuck you. 